All right, we want to welcome everybody coming to um, our program. <clears throat> welcome. My name is Father John Pedigo. I want to welcome uh, those of you that will be watching us on Facebook uh, to join us. <clears throat> we are going to be uh, we're going to start our um, start our program in just a minute. Um, want to welcome you on behalf of Catholic Charities. I'm the I'm Father John, the director for advocacy and community engagement here at Catholic Charities, and our um, uh, the person that will lead us, lead us through this master ceremony um, our, our is, is, um, is uh, Junier Butler, uh, and she is here and will take over from here, and I'll, I'll be working, working the panel, as it says. So take it away, Ms. Junier. Thank you, Father John. We acknowledge that we are the Muica land of the Ohol Ohlone peoples a land that was occupied for nearly 10,000 years prior to European arrival, a land that was never seceded to the Republic of Spain, the Republic of Mexico, the Republic of California, nor to the United States. We acknowledge this land by acknowledging the ongoing struggle of visibility and recognition of the original human inhabitants, their descendants in our midst and their culture. We welcome you to our program. I would like to, I'm not sure if we have the, do we have the choral Father John? I do, would you like that up right now? Yes, if we could have, we will welcome you with the choir from Spelman College, which is a traditional HBCU, historically black college in Atlanta, in Atlanta Georgia for women of color. Okay. Thank you. All right, let me do a screen share just a second.
we are always, or our hearts are always warmed by hearing lift every voice and sing. Let us pause for just a moment. I'd like to share my dream. I dream a world where man, no other man will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its paths adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, no avarice blights our day. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all in mankind. Of such I dream my world. This was written by American poet Langston Hughes. This afternoon, we're delighted to welcome a wonderful speaker, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about her. So you get to know a little bit about her like I know. I know there's much more to know of her. In the African tradition, Mary Lee is the mother of Tammy, the mother of Amy. Hi, Amy, I see you're in the audience here today. The mother of Sarah the mother of Jennifer, and the mother of Rebecca. Born in Omaha, Nebraska, the birthplace of Malcolm X, she is the proud granddaughter of Captain Thomas Rucker, a Buffalo soldier and member of the first class at the Black Officers Training Center at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. Her maternal grandfather, Grant Green, graduated from Missouri Teachers College when he couldn't find a job in his profession, he brought his family to Omaha and spent his working life as a janitor. This daughter, his daughter, Harriet Green Rucker, also received her training in teaching, but Mary Lee was the first person in three generations to actually work as a teacher in Omaha, Nebraska public schools. Professor Zariski attended Creighton University and there met Barisal Shelton. After they graduated, they moved to San Mateo, California. Mrs. Shelton and Judge Shelton raised their four children in San Mateo, while Mary Lee continued her education and began 30 years of college instruction and community activism. Appointed by her police chief in Foster City, Mary Lee served public office as a member of the Criminal Justice Council of San Mateo for seven years. With her father, Dr. Raymond Rucker, they formed Rucker Shelton Communication Services. Mary Lee served as an advisor to the American Indian Title V Committee of San Mateo County and began a long involvement as an activist in the Indian community there in Santa Clara County and Nebraska and South Dakota. She served on a number of commissions and committees Human Rights Commission of San Jose, Police Auditors Advisory Committee, Human Relations Commission and Social Service Commission of Santa Clara County. And she was elected to the Board of Women's Ordination Committee. After a short stint at the exec as the executive director of the Oakland Ensemble, Mary Lee returned back to education and ultimately became a tenured professor at San Jose City College. Communication studies was her primary teaching area, and she was the founder of the Community Arts and Lectures Program at City College. Mary Lee began the Inside Out Support Group for friends and family of incarcerated people in the county. After becoming Professor Emeritus at the college, she has been serving as a chaplain in the detention facilities of Santa Clara County for the Diocese of San Jose. Marilee and her current husband, Larry Sariski, are members of the Basilica Cathedral of St. Joseph's in San Jose, where Marilee continues to serve as lector. Please join me in welcoming Professor Marilee Shelton Sariski. 
Mary Lee, thank you. Thank you so much, June. I hope that you can hear me and see me. Let me know if you can't. Um, I'm really pleased to, to be here and I was really encouraged to listen to um, the choir, the Negro National Anthem being sung by the students. Um, the Negro National Anthem was actually written by um, J. Rosalind Johnson and James Weldon Johnson. James Weldon Johnson was the first uh, secretary of um, the NAACP and he was one of the people that's really accredited with uh, developing the original membership of the NAACP. Um, let's see, I, Janelle, I see your name on my screen, but I don't see anything else. So let me know if uh, at some point there's other things that are going to be on the screen. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but at any rate, because of kind of the development of um, Blacks in our history, particularly from the time of the uh, writing of the Negro National Anthem, all the way through to the time of um, African Americans taking a leadership uh, role in the military, um, having officers that were trained in the military, uh, serving in the armed forces. Um, it seems only appropriate that we start looking as Catholics at the role of African Americans in the Roman Catholic Church in the United States. We were a segregated um, religion, just like many religions were in the United States. Um, if you were a Catholic and you were baptized as a Catholic and you were African American, you were probably a slave and your master uh, probably was Roman Catholic and chose to um, baptize his slaves as uh, Catholics and they may have been raised as Catholics. In the case of the man that we're going to be talking about today, Father Augustus Tolton, he was born as as a slave also, also in 1854. And um, he lived on a plantation in Missouri and uh, was baptized and raised as a Catholic. His parents were both Catholics and he had uh, one brother and a sister. They were all Catholics. But eventually the master of the, the plantation died and didn't have a will. And so uh, the wife was forced to liquidate the assets to pay off her debts. And at that time, um, Augustus's mother realized and father realized that the family was likely to be broken up and sold off as uh, products, material products. Um, and so uh, Augustus's father uh, went to join the um, um, military to fight uh, in the Civil War. Um, and Augustus's mother rounded up the children um, and began her process of escape. Fortunately, the, their slave state was Missouri and kind of right across the border was Illinois. The first stop on the Underground Railroad was Quincy, uh, Illinois, right across the uh, river. And so um, Augustus's mother got a rowboat and she rowed her three children across the river under gunfire, uh, made it to Quincy, Illinois, uh, found um, um, some support in the community um, and began raising her children um, as Catholics, trying to find Catholic schools for her children. Um, and that began um, Father, well, um, Father Agu Gus, we call him uh, Father Gus. It, it began Father Gus's life um, in freedom as an escaped slave who was now a free man um, in the first um stop in the Underground Railroad. Yeah, you can see a kind of reenacted picture of uh, Father Gus and his mom. Um, there's a lot of uh, material that's been written about the plantation that um, he was at. There have only been two other owners since that original owner. Um, the boat, um, 
Quincy, etc., because once the cause of Father Tolton was established, the Vatican had to go and investigate all aspects of his history. One, to find out if, in tr if he truly was a righteous man. So, so they traced his entire heritage as far back as they could, including to the slave plantation that he was born into, um, all the way to the area of the river that they believe um, the family crossed, and then into Quincy, um, and then ultimately into Chicago, which is where ultimately uh, Father um, actually had his uh, most of his service. Um, Father Tolton, once he arrived in Quincy, um, it was a segregated community, um, but the nuns and priests there in uh, Quincy realized that Father Tolton was, um, had a, a real propensity to perhaps become a priest. And so they started looking for uh, seminaries for um, Gus to go to. And uh, they sent out correspondence to, I don't know, probably every known seminary in the United States. And the idea of accepting a black man uh, or a black young man as a seminarian was evidently not acceptable uh, for Catholics um, who were in charge of seminaries at that time. And so after quite a few years and just a little bit before his, uh, well, at age 26 or so, he finally um, uh, was accepted at seminary in Rome because there was no place in the United States that would accept him as a seminarian. Um, he um, studied there in 1886 and um, in 1889, he finally was returned back um, to Quincy, Illinois to start his ministry in Quincy, Illinois. He didn't actually serve very long in Quincy. He experienced uh, quite a lot of discrimination. Um, he was an excellent speaker and that was um, to his benefit and to the benefit of the African-American community, uh, maybe to the benefit of the Catholic community generally. But um, the local parish priest felt very threatened by this because people would come all around to the church that he was at um, and they would leave their parish in order to go and listen to Father uh, Gus uh, when he was uh, at various different places. So eventually the discrimination that he faced in Quincy was so strong that he requested to go to Chicago. And at St. At uh, Chicago, um, he came in um, 1889, so after just a brief stint back in Quincy, and he um, stayed in um, St. Monica's, uh, he, he was told to basically build St. Monica's church. Um, he took his uh, parish, his, his African-American Catholics, and used the basement of a church in um, Chicago uh, to say mass while he was constructing St. Monica's. And um, he was able to do fundraising throughout Chicago uh, by speaking to raise money for materials to build St. Monica's. And he was able, he was successful in building four stone walls and the flooring um, and um, was encouraged, I guess. All right. Uh, but he never actually completed the church. The, the roof of the church was never raised. Um, and um, so since he actually wasn't, um, he didn't start his ministry in Chicago until 1889. By 1897, um, he was still practicing his, practicing his ministry, but didn't really have a physical church for the black community. Uh, they didn't have a, a place that wasn't in the basement of someone else's church. Um, but he served the, the, his parish, which was 
virtually entirely African American and very poor at that time. Um, you know, just post uh, the Civil War. So very, very poor, uh, recently freed black people. Um, people that had um, all kinds of diseases, sicknesses, uh, were in a state of poverty. Uh, Father Gus would uh, tend to the needs of, of the poor, um, do last rites, um, serve, see the sick, pray to the sick, etc. And he caught a number of contagious diseases and was ill a great deal of the time. And there were times when Father Gus was so sick that he would actually have his altar boys um, actually set up a chair at the altar so that he could continue to say mass um, at Saint, um, the, the church that um, he was borrowing um, until St. Monica's was ultimately um, completed. But as I said, never really uh, completed. Um, July 9th, 1897 uh, was a particularly um, hot and humid time of the year in Chicago. If anybody has ever been in Chicago, Illinois, you know. And Father Gus was, um, went to a, a meeting of priests, um, rode by street, streetcar and, and then returned from the meeting. And uh, he had his uh, long black Cossack on. It was at that time, you know, we didn't have wash and wear type stuff. So it would have been wool, black wool. And uh, it was um, over 100 degrees in Chicago. He got off the streetcar, collapsed from uh, heat stroke, and ultimately died. Um, he died never really succeeding in having a parish church, um, never really completing his dream of a uh, parish for his black um, followers. Um, he never lost faith. He never lost hope. He was never bitter uh, about the fact that um, he had such, he incurred such animosity, even among other priests, every time he would speak to raise money in order to um, build his uh, parish, build his parish church, that um, the average person, I think, would have been very discouraged and very bitter. And he wasn't. Um, when his funeral was held, um, the 10th of um, July at St. Monica's. Um, there were thousands of people that showed up at his funeral. And over the years, there has been a lot of talk about Father Gus and his influence, particularly in Chicago amongst African-American Catholics. But this reputation actually spread beyond that. And there were not a lot of, there were a lot of people, mostly African-Americans, but not just African-Americans. Um, many people in Quincy, Illinois, um, as well as throughout the state um, who knew about his personality, um, his faith, his deep faith, his refusal to be cynical, um, and so ultimately, um, there was a mass to begin uh, the, the Cardinal of um, Chicago, uh, began the process of the cause of sainthood for Father Augustus Tolton. And I think that uh, Father John has a little um, video clip on um, the actual part of the service when they actually formally began the process of the cause for sainthood. Let's see if we can uh, bring that up. The ceremony in St. James Chapel at the Quigley Center played to a full house, and well it should. 
In official terms, it was the proclamation and first session of the canonical trial examining possible sainthood for Father Augustus Tolton. For those in attendance, it was a big deal. When I first heard it, I said, Uncle Gus, you have not been forgotten for all the hard struggle, the work trying to create a place for worship for black Catholics, an Asian, a white person to kneel together and worship our creator. That's what it's all about. In March of 2010, as part of the Year for Priests, Cardinal Francis George decided to pursue the cause of sainthood for Father Tolton the first African-American priest to serve not only in the Archdiocese of Chicago, but anywhere in the nation. He was accepted and he wasn't. Uh, he did better up here than he did in Quincy in Southern Illinois, but it was hard. And yet in the midst of the hardship, he was very joyful. And that's what convinced me, maybe it's time to declare Tol Tolton a saint to the Catholic Church as a holy priest who despite the suffering was never angry and was always persistent uh, in his helping people to understand who Christ is and was joyful. Cardinal George appointed Bishop Joseph Perry as the diocesan postulator for the cause for Father Tolton's sainthood a role that Bishop Perry embraces. During the period of, of slavery and emancipation and reconstruction, uh, even through the period of segregation and discrimination thereafter, moving up to the civil rights laws of that, there is no one in this country who has emerged as a saint. In all of that history, that huge stretch there, Tolton surfaces as a minister in our Catholic tradition, someone who suffered in light of that, but still remained steadfast, he was faithful. Uh, he didn't dish back anything that was dished out to him. He tried to bring a semblance of Christian faith and Catholicity to a group of people who were not ministered to very well. Okay, I think I've stopped that. And um, so one of the things that uh, Bishop Perry talked about is the fact that Father Tolton was the ultimate suffering servant. Um, he physically suffered. Um, he was never terribly successful at the things that he tried to do. Uh, he was quite old as a seminarian and he had a very short period of time that he ultimately uh, remained a priest. In his 40s, he died. Um, but we now know that there is a cause for sainthood. And there's been a great deal of research now. There's a huge investigatory team that came from Rome to investigate the righteousness of, of Father Perry. And now he's gone through stages of beatification where um, there have been, I believe, one or two um, miracles that have been attributed to Father Tolton. And at the very end of my presentation today, I'd like to read you um, at the very end the prayer for the cause of Father Augustus Tolton, because um, basically there needs to be one more documented miracle and then it should automatically happen, or maybe it won't automatically, but it would be imminent that Father Tolton would be the first black priest in the United States who also became a saint. Um, and that would be really wonderful, I think, um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there are not a lot of people that experience as much failure and discrimination um, you know, he was an escaped slave and he was treated as an illegal person for much of the first part of his life. So for a person to be so positive, so joyful, so productive and never have to have lost his faith makes him a pretty exceptional candidate for sainthood. Um, there's a couple of things that uh, we can all do um, in support of Father Gus. One is to say the prayer that I'm going to say, ultimately. Uh, two, to request a, a prayer card. And you can actually order them on Amazon uh, if you wanted to. 
um, or through uh, Father John, you could request one from me and, and I have a few. Um, but there is a novena uh, to Father Augustus Tolton. And it's, um, I think, really important because it's a novena for the, um, um, for the spiritual welfare of the Black American community in the United States, sorry. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, it's, it transcends uh, Roman Catholicism uh, as the first Black Roman Catholic priest in the United States uh, who's likely to become a saint. Um, this particular novena um, deals with a number of significant issues from um, the stability and strength of marriages and family in the Black community uh, to, um, uh, let's see, a prayer for peace in the Black community, uh, particularly um, uh, when there's disrest, po political, physical disrest. Um, it uh, prays, there's a, a prayer in the novena for the good educational opportunities in the Black community. Uh, it, the sixth prayer is gainful economic opportunities in the Black community. Um, and the ninth prayer, I'm skipping some, the ninth prayer is for more vocations to the priesthood, the diaconate, um, and the consecrated life uh, from the Black community. Um, all of these um, aspects of the novena, um, I think, are ones that are very important to all African Americans, irregardless of their religion. And there's some suggestions as to when the novenas should take place. Um, either prefacing uh, Father Gus's birth, which would be March 23rd, um, or prefacing the date of his ordination, which would be um, April 15th to April 23rd. He, he was actually ordained on Easter Sunday. And then prefacing his um, death, which would be a time between June 30th and July 8th, he died on July 9th. Um, so all of these times might be a good time to actually have a novena. In the city of San Jose, where I live and, and some of you may live, uh, we actually have um, a jazz festival. And um, the oldest church in the state of California is the Basilica Cathedral of St. Joseph's. And at the cathedral, um, we actually have a jazz mass um, in the summertime. And it's a kind of interesting time. It's a time when there's a lot of um, unrest in the black community across the country. All right. Uh, but it's a joyous time in San Jose because in particular, because of the jazz festival and we have our jazz mass. And the majority of people that actually come to St. Joseph's at that time actually aren't necessarily Roman Catholics, but a lot of African Americans. I think this would be a really important time uh, to talk to folks and begin the process of novena for Father Gus uh, right around July, uh, when it's the time of the uh, maybe jazz mass, that might be a really good time. At any rate, um, I think that Father Gus is important. He's really important to me personally. Um, Many of us study Job and the strength of faith that Job has, but it's hard to relate to somebody so far in the past. Father Gus suffered every kind of affliction, basically because of poverty. He suffered every kind of indignation because of discrimination. Um, and he suffered every kind of um, embarrassment um, in spite of all of that, because of his personality, he teaches us a lesson, which is that um, none of us have probably experienced the kind of um, disappointment, setback, and failures that Father Gus did. But if he could go through that, then we should be able to um, transcend any problems that we have. Perhaps 
with his help. And so um, this is a prayer that I'd like to read in closing. And if, um, if there's a section in it well, I'll, where I'll interrupt my prayer to tell you that it is where you interject your request, your prayer request. And if your prayer request physically or um, spiritually is granted, you need to report the granting of your request through the diocese, through the office of the cardinal in Chicago, because we're really waiting for that last miracle. And I think it's imminent. So first of all, um, you saw a picture of Father Joseph Perry. Father Joseph Perry, that was the last part of the video. Uh, Father Joseph Perry and I have met before, and he is the man that's in charge. He's actually been assigned the cause of uh, Father Gus to sainthood. So I'm going to read the prayer. I'm going to interrupt it to tell you that this is where you might um, include your requests. And then I'm going to encourage you to report any success that you have so that we could anticipate imminently um, his sainthood. All right, so here it is. Here's the prayer. Uh, here's Father, uh, here's uh, Bishop Perry um, at, his, at the rectory for the bishop in um, Chicago. All right, so here's the prayer that actually uh, Bishop Perry composed for the cause of Father Augustus Tolton. Oh God, we give you thanks for your servant and priest, Father Augustus Tolton, who labored among us in times of contradiction, times that were both beautiful and paradoxical. His ministry helped lay the foundation for a truly Catholic gathering in faith in our time. We stand in the shadow of his ministry. May his life continue to inspire us and imbue us with that confidence and hope that will forge a new evangelization for the church we love. Father in heaven, Father Tolton suffering. Father heaven, Father Tolton suffering service shed lights upon our sorrows. We see them through the prism of your son's passion and death. If it be your will, O oh God, Glorify your servant, Father Tolton, by granting the favor I now ask through his intercession. And this is where you mention your request on behalf of Father Tolton. So that all may know the goodness of this priest whose memory looms large in the church he loved. Complete what you have begun in us that we might work for the fulfillment of you your kingdom, not to us the glory, but the glory to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are God, living and reigning forever and ever. Amen. And again, this was written and composed by Bishop Joseph Perry. Um, and I wish to thank you for your attention. God bless every one of you. And I'm going to turn it back to you, Father John. I think we go back I, to Ms. Junier. Yes. Oh, Professor, it's, okay. it's just a joy to hear you speak on this topic. And it's, um, I, 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 I think that um, we don't know enough about our black Catholics and we definitely, I, even me, I did not know or heard of Bishop Tolton. I mean, uh, Father Tolton until maybe a couple of years ago. Our, and you mentioned about the, um, about the novena and with the, um, the, the jazz, uh, the jazz, uh, the jazz festivals. I know they, they do that jazz concert down there. How can we, let our people know within the diocese. This is stuff we, yeah, we go to the jazz festival just because we're going to the jazz festival. But we're not, you know, we're just going because we're going to, you know, do the thing. But there's actually so much more to it. And I'd like to know how can we 
um, as 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 parishes within the diocese know more about Father Gus. I've read the story. I've read many of it just recently, and it just it just it it almost just breaks your heart in a sense. And to know that he died so young, and all of the stuff that you know he had to had to actually go to. Now I've I've presented two or three questions here already. So how about can you can you talk to us specifically? Then we'll get to the jazz piece and the novena. But can you speak specifically about the ones or, or you, you spoke generally how he was not received and you know discriminated in a sense? Can you speak specifically on those? people and they were priests who just simply they seem like they live to make somebody's life miserable to make his life miserable no yeah it, uh, yeah I, they didn't although frankly you know the, our church was a segregated church you know it it took you know it wasn't until the 60s really in the 70s yeah, 1970s that uh, we started seeing uh, integrated churches of any type, but particularly Roman Catholic churches. But in the 1800s, mm -hmm. um, all the churches were segregated, right? Um, and the problem was, though, um, particularly in Quincy, Illinois, it, it also happened to be the first stop in the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. So there were a number of people that were very white people that were very supportive of, yeah. of the Underground Railroad. Um, and there were, you know, very enlightened um, people. And so once they realized that they had the first black priest in America that was right in Quincy, um, then people came from all around to sit in his uh, church and listen to him. He was evidently an extraordinary speaker. And then eventually he asked to travel from parish to parish to raise money. Um, because you know the African American community was very very poor, all right. So as he went from parish to parish, the parish priest started becoming a little irritated because people wouldn't wouldn't stay in their parish. They'd go listen to Father Gus. He was an extraordinary speaker. He was a one of a kind. And if you happen to be proud of the Underground Railroad and the fact that it existed in Quincy then you might have been really proud of the fact that one of the escapees, the most famous escapee from uh, coming into the Underground Railroad in Quincy was now Father Augustus Tolton. And so I, I don't think that the priesthood was, um, I don't think they necessarily had bad intentions, but they were jealous. And I think they were a little overwhelmed with the fact that they were losing their parishes frequently um, every time Father Tolton appeared anywhere else. And the same happened when he was in Chicago. Um, even though he was assigned an exclusively black parish and the physical facilities were not very good. The problem was it was Father Gus's job to raise money to build the church. I mean, that's that's something most priests don't have to do. You know, they're assigned to a parish. They mm -hmm. don't have to like build a church too, right? But he actually had to build a church, but he had to get the money for the materials to build the church. Mm -hmm. And in Chicago, a lot of old churches were built with stones. So he actually did that by going all around Chicago to various different parishes and he spoke and the priests got a little irritated because he was really a good speaker and very effective so i think that is the problem yeah and i i heard also i believe he was a singer as well he, 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 had, a, he had a good very good singing voice and you know i would agree i i'm sure that you know although things have changed times have changed but there's always that um, that element that um, is there. There's always been people that have supported African Americans or supported our cause, and also we have also been a, a a people that have been resourceful. So that's hardly anything, in, you know, sort of like new, new. But when we see that, and we say, oh, they did that back then. Yes, that's basically how we got it, you know, because that's basically 
I don't know if you want to call it in our genes or something, but his story is 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 it's just and, and I guess for because of his life was so short. And I do remember reading about you know him being ordained. It was like Easter Sunday in Rome, and he had these aspirations of going to Africa, and that got sidetracked real quick. So he didn't go. He I don't think he ever went to Africa, did he? Yeah, I think the problem was um, he experienced so much discrimination in Quincy. I mean, he, there there were um, there were some nuns and priests that were really impressed with how gifted he was in Quincy. They mm -hmm. taught him to speak German. Mm -hmm. uh, he spoke, uh, he knew Latin. Um, he, he was quite um, well learned, but the priests, the, a few priests and nuns there actually took, took it upon themselves mm -hmm. to give him informal seminary and training while mm -hmm. they spent years writing to try to find a seminary that would accept him. All right. So there was a small number of religious that were really on his corner and that gave him unconditional support and love. But the larger community um, was not quite as supportive. Mm -hmm. um, but when he went to um, Rome, um, he actually thought, OK, back home in Quincy, um, I don't have a massive discrimination. Um, the majority of priests were not particularly happy with me, etc. So once I finish my seminarian uh, studies, I'd like to be a um, uh, what do you call it? Um, what do you call it? I forgot that a mission priest. I forgot that there's another word for that. I forgot what it is. And I'm having a block because I'm really old. All right. But anyway, um, so he thought, OK, they'll send me to an African country and then I'll get to be a real honest to God parish priest with a real church and then all I have to really do is concentrate on um, delivering my spiritual messages of Catholicism to my parish and so he was really looking forward to that and it, it pretty much the last minute once he was um, ordained they said you know the United States has uh, eliminated slavery supposedly we believe in um human equality, uh, you know, supposedly we are a world leader now in ending slavery and it's time to put your money where your mouth is. And so they said, we're sending you back to Quincy, Illinois. And I think he was really disappointed. I think he was thinking, oh, you know, I'm finally <laughs> accepted by my people, you know, that, and I would imagine that Africans would have loved to have had Father Gus as their, you know, parish priest. You know, I it, it, this conversation is so interesting and there's so much more for us to know. I'd like to know if there's anybody in the audience that would have a question or something for Mary Lee. And then Mary Lee can let us, Professor can let us know about how we can um, do this thing for the, the, the novena and the jazz mask. Father John? Yeah, I just, I just, it just strikes me um, about this, um, that uh, blessed, uh, Gus Tolton, uh, Augustus Tolton, his, it, it, it's, it's like he was from the people, the people themselves are calling him forward where, where oftentimes it seems to be the institution calling priests forward to kind of maintain the status quo of the institution. He's quite the reverse. And the other thing is, is it kind of strikes me is that it, he, just the very fact that you have a, a formerly enslaved person who is now mm -hmm. ordained as you know, recognized by the Holy Father, by the Pope as a priest. And in those days, a priest was kind of seen as a, a kind of above, a, a, a elevated status, you know, uh, certainly for Catholics. Mm -hmm. And it made, I think, I wonder, it just must have been very hard for white Catholics to kind of get their heads around that, that a, a formerly enslaved person who is now a priest recognized by the father studied in Rome and is now coming back. It, it, it just must have gotten under the craw of clergy and white, some white Catholics. And I think that, that, that example of not just being the first among this, you know, a, 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 a kind of a recognized um, African American person, but the fact that he was unabashedly African American priest, because there were other uh, priests that were ordained before him that were black, 
but they didn't identify as black because it, it passed. But he he couldn't he did not. Face face on everything. No. Yeah, it's um, it, it's interesting. Father Gus, in particular, the thing that I really like about him, um, and in the novena, is that um, I, I it, it's my fantasy. Well, okay, I'll be honest. All right, my birthday is July 9th. It happened to be the same date as when Father Gus died. Of mm -hmm. course, wasn't actually born on the year that uh, <laughs> Father Gus died. But uh, the, mm -hmm. July 9th is an important date for me. All right, mm -hmm. but it's also summertime, and in my life experience, I've seen a lot of political unrest, rioting in Watts. Um, you know, all kinds of uh, real problems, political, uh, human rights problems within the Black community in the summertime. All right. Mm -hmm. My personal bias is that I would love to see, at least in my adopted home city of San Jose, California, I'd like to see somewhere around the time of the Jazz Mass, a novena. All right. So probably nine days before or nine days after something in there, all right? And I'd like, I would love to see, a fantasy of mine would be to see some of the leaders within the black community forgetting whether they happen to be Catholic or not. I'd love to see uh, Bishop Dace from Bible Way Christian Center and, you know, just all kinds of really cool people that are leaders within the um, African-American community um, who probably many of them come anyway uh, to the jazz, you know, to, to the jazz festival. I'd love to see them come and be exposed to Father Gus. I like um, us here on the West Coast, but particularly in the oldest church in the state of California, uh, the cathedral, to actually say, come and pick up a, a prayer card for Father Gus, pray to him, let's all work in the community to advance his state as sainthood. Um, for those of you who might want to learn more about Catholicism, this might be your opportunity. But if not, um, the life of Father Augustus Tolton is not unlike the life of uh, Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. What Baptist person doesn't think that Mother Teresa was an awesome person? What you Jewish know. person? think Mother Teresa was an awesome person. We're all, this is really profound and you've planted a seed and I really, I, you mentioned people that I'd like to go forth with too. So we're, okay. we're really up against the time. So Father John. So yeah, we're up against the time, but I want to uh, thank um, all of you for coming and on behalf of the agency, thank you. Thank you for um, for uh, for joining us, Professor uh, Shelton. I got to know you as Marilee, but, <laughs> but in this former settling, settling, setting, you're uh, Professor Shelton. Uh, so I want to thank you for this. I want to thank Junier, um, the agency. Thanks Junier for helping uh, you know, bring bring uh, consciousness, conscientization to, um, to African-Americans, African-American clergy, African-American uh, laity, and certainly the African-American experience in Catholicism and beyond. So thank you for, for this conversation, um, uh, all of you, and thank you to Junie for producing it, and thank you to, um, to Professor Shelton for sharing this time. So I wanna thank all of you for your time uh, this, um, <clears throat> this lunch period. Uh, hope you'll join us uh, in the future for other programming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Bye. Thanks again. June.